perfect uh, we'll get started with today's lecture so today is the final class on controller design uh, we are going to talk about adaptive controller today and in order to motivate adaptive controller let me start with an example so i have a car and i have two problems in my car the first problem is uh, sometimes I drive my car with uh, only me in the car. Sometimes I drive with my wife and kids. Sometimes I drive only with my wife. Sometimes I drive the car with my friends. And what happens in all these situations? There are different number of people in the vehicle. As a result of which the mass of the vehicle is quite different. So let's say the original mass of the vehicle is 2000 kilograms and we have five people of 100 kilograms each and maybe a couple of luggage in the back which might be another uh, 50 or so kilograms. So all in all we have changed the mass of the vehicle from 2000 kilograms to 2550 kilograms which is a fairly big range uh, given that a car is only 2000 uh, like the car has a weight of 2000 kilograms. So in this case what you are seeing is that there is a parameter of the vehicle which is the mass of the vehicle that seems to change from one trip to another right so initially the vehicle is only 2000 kilogram if i am only i am there in the vehicle then it's 2100 kilogram if there are two more people in the vehicle besides me besides the driver then it's 2300 kilogram and so on so as a result of which the mass of the vehicle is changing from one trip to another I have another problem in my vehicle, which is uh, the air conditioning load on the vehicle. So I set the temperature always to do 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever temperature I want to set it to. Uh, but depending on the weather conditions, which is outside the vehicle and depending on the thermal properties of the coolant and the quality of the coolant inside the vehicle and the pressure of the coolant inside the vehicle, the overall thermodynamics of the, of the air conditioning cooling system is quite different. And so now my question is, uh, given from one trip to another, so I don't know how many of you know, but typically some, of, some amount of coolant from an air conditioning system also leaks. Like, it may not leak, leak in all air conditioning systems, but if you have some degradation in your pipes and so on, some amount of coolant is going to leak. So over a period of a year or two years, you might see a drop in the pressure of the coolant of your, uh, of your air conditioning system. So now my question to you is, uh, uh, from one trip to another, from today's trip to the next trip, how much is the drop in the pressure of the coolant? from one trip to another. So what do you think uh, would that number be? And the answer is actually that number is going to be very small. So some of the degradation happens very slowly. So the tire degradation happens very slowly. The coolant pressure changes very slowly. Um, uh, some of the material properties of the battery, let's say if you have an electric vehicle, the battery properties will change very slowly. So one trip to another, those parameters are not going to change very drastically. But then there is something that changes quite drastically, which is the mass of the vehicle. <clears throat> so whenever you have an autonomous system where some parameters are changing abruptly or some parameters are changing slowly, you come up with what is known as an adaptive control scheme for those systems. So that's what we are going to be talking about today. Overall, there are two types of uh, adaptive systems. So one is called model reference. Adaptive control. And the second one is adaptive.
iterative learning control. So in model reference adaptive control, you have a parameter that changes quite significantly from one, uh, one situation to another. Whereas in adaptive iterative learning control, the parameter actually changes slowly from one operating condition to another. Okay, so this one is generally for degradation. That happens gradually. And this is for parameters, abrupt changes in the parameters. So if you have an autonomous system and let's say some information was corrupted by the adversary, uh, Either some information was corrupted by the adversary or some system parameters were changed by the adversary. Which of the two situations you will see? Which of the two controllers would you need to use in that case? If an attacker is purposefully changing something abruptly, then you need to use model reference adaptive control. On the other hand, if the adversary is changing things very slowly in your system, for whatever reason, then you need to use adaptive iterative learning control, okay? So for abrupt changes, this is the, this is the tool that you want to use. For gradual changes, this is the tool you want to use. Okay, any questions so far? So we are not going to go into the full-blown theory of it, so I'll give you some examples of how these adaptive control techniques are used in designing controllers. So, so far we have read about PID controllers. We have read about, uh, I mean, we've talked about uh, robust controllers, optimization-based controllers. So adaptive control is the final topic on this uh, series. Okay. So here is the issue. Uh, my actual system xt plus 1 equals axt plus ut and the reference the reference signal is x bar t plus 1 equals to a bar x bar t plus rt. And so error et equals to xt minus x bar t. Have any of you driven a vehicle with all five people in the vehicle? And have you driven a vehicle with only you in the vehicle? Have you noticed the difference in the performance of the vehicle when there are five people versus when there is one person? So that's this scenario, okay? So this A is a parameter that is unknown. I don't know what this parameter is. Now if you recall from optimization or from your EC3551, uh, which is feedback control systems, you need to know what the system dynamics is in order to design the controller. So you cannot do PID tuning without knowing about the system. Uh, you cannot do optimization or robust control-based design without knowing the dynamics of the system. But here we have a situation where I don't know what this A value is, okay? Because I don't know what the mass of the vehicle is. 
Your vehicle controller doesn't know what the mass of the vehicle is. It doesn't have a mass sensor that senses how many people are sitting inside the vehicle, how much luggage is there in the vehicle. So I'm in this situation. But actually, I want to track this particular reference signal. So I'm entering a freeway. I need to go from 0 miles per hour to 70 miles an hour within a distance of 500 meters or so, whatever that distance is. So this is the reference signal. This is the reference velocity that I need to track. Uh, where the reference signal is very, uh, it, it's spelled out uh, accurately. And this A bar is known. So I'm in a situation where this A is unknown, but this A bar is known. And I want this error, which is xt minus x bar t, to go to 0. OK? I want something. I want to come up with a controller, ut equals to gamma t of xt. I want to design this gamma t in a way that this et goes to 0. So the goal is design t equals 1 to infinity such that et goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. OK, so let's try to think about this problem. How do we go about solving this problem? So let's consider the situation where A is known. OK, so let's say case 1. So I'm just doing some thought experiments. OK, I'm not giving you the solution right away. Let's do some thought experiment. So let's assume that I have a case where x0 equals to x bar naught. A is known. Remember that A bar is always known, RT is always known, XT is always known. I can always observe the velocity of the vehicle. And X bar T is always known, which is I know exactly what trajectory I want to track, uh, what is the reference signal that I want to track. So I have a case where X0 equals to X bar naught. So the initial condition of both the dynamics is the same. A is also known. Okay, So I know what A is. Uh, and let's consider situation. So this is case 1. Let's consider situation A, where A bar is equal to A. What should your control policy UT be? Can someone tell me what this ut should be? So my a bar is equal to a. So these two values are equal. And my x0, the initial condition here is the same as initial condition here. What should the value of ut be? So that my error is 0. I want my error to go to 0. What can I pick as ut? I should also note here that a is less than 1. A, sorry, a bar is less than 1. So if I pick ut equals to rt, what do you think is going to happen? So if my this ut is the same as this rt here, remember I'm, I, I know what rt value is, I know what a bar is, I know what x bar t is, so I know all of this stuff. If I pick my ut to be exactly equal to rt, then you will notice that xt plus 1 and x bar t plus 1 will be the same because they, they have the same equation. a bar is equal to a, ut is equal to rt, so these two things are tracking each other. So my error will always be 0.
So ET is going to be equal to zero for all T. I don't have any error. Now let's consider the second situation. A bar is not equal to A. And I want to pick my UT. Well, how should I pick my UT so that my ET is equal to zero? Let me give you the expression. If this is A bar minus A XT plus RT. <coughs> then this would imply that ET is uniformly zero. ET is always zero, even under this particular situation. So even if there is a model mismatch, but I know what value of A, A is, so I, I, I remember A is known in this particular case. So I can always pick this as my control action, as a function of the state, and then my error is going to be zero. Everyone agrees with case 1A and 1B? <clears throat> okay, awesome. Now I have my case two. X naught is not equal to X naught bar. A is known. And my question is remains the same. Uh, it's the same thing, A bar is not equal to A. So we'll look at a more complicated situation here. What is my error signal ET? So let's look at what my E0 is. X0 minus x bar 0. What is my E1? A x 0 plus sorry I haven't told you what my ut is. I'm going to keep the same ut. This is my ut here as well. In case 2. So in the, my control policy in case 1b and case 2 is the same. So I have a bar minus a x naught plus r0 minus a bar x bar 0 minus r0. So this is my x1. This is my x bar 1. Is this clear? I want to pause here for a bit. I want to make sure that all of you understand what I'm trying to do here. Any questions so far? Can someone tell me what E1 is? Any questions on this? Yes. So then would it just be A bar minus A times A0? Yes. A bar, no, actually not A bar minus A. So 
this minus a x naught will cancel with this. This r naught will cancel with this. So all I'm left with is a bar x naught minus a bar x bar naught. That is a bar x zero minus x bar zero, which is equal to a bar e zero. It turns out that in this case, ET plus 1 is equal to A bar ET. And given that A bar is less than 1, A bar is less than 1, these are all, by the way, scalar systems. So A bar is less than 1. What happens to ET? ET goes to zero, ST goes to infinity. Any question so far? So let me explain what we have done. We have the actual dynamics. We have a reference signal to track. We want to design a control policy so that the error in the signal, the actual signal minus the reference signal goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So of course, originally A is unknown, but I want to try to figure out the case when A is known. How do I get the error to go to zero? So when A is known, under these assumptions, we are able to figure out uh, the policy so that the error goes to zero, okay? So in these two cases, the error is exactly zero. In this case, the error goes to zero, even if there is a mismatch between the reference signal in the beginning and the signal that my current signal is, uh, if there is a mismatch, between the reference and the actual signal, that's completely fine. The error will still go to zero. And that's because my A bar is less than one. Now let's try to solve the original problem, which is I don't quite know what my A is, okay? So that's my case three, which is A is unknown. So can I erase everything? Okay. A unknown, this is my original problem. X zero may not be equal to X bar zero. So the reference signal and there might be a mismatch between the actual initial state and the reference state in the beginning. Now the idea here, so remember here, the U was taken as a linear function of X naught and R naught, so yeah, so remember that gamma T of XT was A bar minus A XT plus RT, okay? That was the case here. That was the case in 1B as well, right? So remember this was the policy that we had picked. Uh, in the entire construction of this policy, the only thing I do not know is this A, okay? I don't know this parameter. I know this, I know this, and I know this. So how do I come up with a strategy gamma T? Uh, in the case when I don't quite know A, well, technically what we have to do is estimate what the value of A is based on the dynamics that we are seeing. And on that basis, we can pick the value of gamma t. So now, I'm going to replace it by kt. So I want to pick my gamma t 
of x t as k t x t plus r t. And I want to continue to update k t from one time step to another so that my error goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. Now it turns out that a lot of people have spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what this kt should be. And, and the other thing to remember is all we are observing is xt and x bar t and a bar and rt. We are not really observing a directly. So somehow I need to construct a method to compute kt which only takes into account things that we can observe, but doesn't take into account things that, that we do not observe, things that we do not have any knowledge about. So here is the way to do it. Here is the one way to do it. I mean, there could be multiple ways to do it. So I'm going to define two signals. Any observation about these two signals? What do you see? What do you notice about these two signals? So I start with some initial condition and I multiply it by a bar here and then I add xt here. So all in all, I know this a bar, I know xt so I can compute phi t plus 1. What am I using here? ut is something I know, a bar is something I know, xt xt plus 1 is something I know, zt is something I'm computing and a bar is something I know. So I have constructed two signals, phi t plus 1 and zt plus 1. Uh, initialized with 0 and 0 and I can completely observe this system, okay? I'm, I mean I can completely uh, calculate these two variables. Now here is I'm going, here is how I'm going to update my kt plus 1. I will pick kt, so k0 is random, k0 can be picked arbitrarily. I've used gamma already, so I have to use something else. What should I pick? Alpha. Have we used alpha yet? No, right? Alpha phi t
So what happens? Uh, so what is happening? So I'm standing at x naught. I need to figure out u naught. So I'm going to pick u naught with some arbitrary k naught. So k naught is picked arbitrarily. Uh, you can pick whatever k naught you want. Uh, it's, I, I mean, of course, you have to pick it within the reasonable range, but uh, depending on the application, you would know what a reasonable k naught looks like. So you'll pick a reasonable k naught in the beginning, and you will implement an action, and then you will compute. Uh, you will have x1, x bar 1, phi 1, and z1. You will compute all of these things. Once you know that, you will plug it in this particular equation. So k naught plus alpha phi naught, blah, blah, blah. You will figure all of this out. And then you get kt plus 1. And then you will implement kt plus 1 xt plus rt. Okay, That's the signal that you will then input again into the system. And you will keep doing this again and again. You will keep updating the value of phi t, z t. Based on that, you will update the value of kt to kt plus 1, and then you will implement the action. So in, in all this process, you're only using the information you already have. You're not using A anywhere. So, so far, whatever control policy we had done in case 1 and 2, we had used explicitly the value of A for computing the action. Now we are not using the value of A for computing the action. And the result is that as long as alpha is between 0 and 2, ET goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. Of course, the proof is beyond the scope of uh, today's lecture because it's a fairly complicated proof. And you know, the, it's, it's not like people have not thought about it for a long time. These kind of ideas have been around since 1970s and 80s. So, uh, so a lot of such problems have been solved. Uh, so after a long analysis, you can actually prove that if you set your gain to be updated according to this, this, uh, this uh, update rule, then your error will actually go to zero as t goes to infinity. And this is known as an adaptive control. Remember what we are able to accomplish here, even if I don't know what the system parameter is, I'm able to come up with a policy which updates itself in a way that the error asymptotically goes to zero. This is the idea of adaptive control. And what would, where we will apply this adaptive control? Well, whenever there is a cyber attack on a system, some parameters of the system would change. And you wouldn't know how, what that parameter has changed to. So you apply tools from adaptive control in order to figure out the new policy, new autonomous control policy, so that the error, the tracking error goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Now in this case, remember we had no idea about A. A was completely unknown to us and we were still able to figure out a way to get the error to zero. So in the next policy that I'm going to talk about, or next uh, topic, which is adaptive iterative learning control, will have the system dynamics which changes slightly from one run to another, okay? So the question is, if your system is only going to change slightly, if your A changed only slightly from today to tomorrow, how exactly are you going to come up with a policy that improves on your performance? And takes error ET to go to zero. So let's talk about that topic. Any questions on this? No?
So the problem here is my xt plus 1 is equal to AT transpose FT XT plus UT and this is also in R. So this is a vector, this is a vector uh, but the inner product is a scalar and so XT plus 1 is a scalar, XT is a scalar and UT is a scalar. So all of these are scalar quantities. And my X bar T is the reference signal just like before and my error ET is equal to XT minus X bar T. Oh, uh, I did not write, AT is unknown. But remember, AT changes uh, from today's AT to tomorrow's AT, it's not going to change significantly. It's going to change only slightly. So, but AT is unknown. FT is known. And of course, the goal remains the same. I want to design UT, I want to design gamma T such that ET goes to zero. But here is the small difference between the previous one. I want a different chalk. Uh, so what is the goal here? So, so I start with gamma t0, so the first iteration of policy, let me write it. to get ET1, then use, well, to get error ET1, then use error ET1 to get policy gamma T1 and then back to this step. Okay, so here is what is happening here. So I have a thermal, uh, I have a uh, air conditioning system and the coolant of that air conditioning system is leaking slowly. Okay, so today uh, I have this room, I have an air conditioning system for this room, the coolant is leaking slowly. Uh, so today I'm going to control it in a certain fashion. I'm going to come up with a policy gamma T0, uh, a control policy gamma T0 and I'm going to control it today. My temperature set point, X bar T reference signal is 72 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the day. And it is, I don't know, uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Let's say that's our reference signal. I'm going to apply this policy and I'm going to observe what the error for today is. Okay, I'm looking at the error throughout the day. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up 
and I'm going to get the error for the entire day, okay? So, so think of t as hours of the day and this one as the date itself, the date of the, of the day. So I get the error for the entire day, entire 24 hours period based on my policy gamma t0. Now I'm going to use this error, I'm going to plug in this error into a bunch of formula in order to get the updated policy gamma t1, which I'm going to apply it tomorrow. I'm going to apply this tomorrow, I'll get another set of errors, et2, and I'm going to use that et2 to drive gamma t3, and so on and so forth. I'll continue to look at the error on a daily basis, and I'm going to use that error to adjust the policy for the next day, and I'm going to control according to the new policy on the next day, and then I'll do it all over again. I'll look at the error, update the policy, look at the error, update the policy. That's why this algorithm is known as iterative learning control. So I'm doing iterations over the days. I'm learning the new policy, and then I'm using that to control the system. In uh, modern day, it's also called reinforcement learning, but in older days, it used to be called adaptive iterative learning control. So the, the Adaptive control and reinforcement learning are not, not too different from a theoretical viewpoint, from a mathematical viewpoint. <clears throat> so here is the idea. In the kth iteration, my utk is going to be x bar tk minus a hat tk transpose f XTK. So K is the day, T is the hours, K is the day. So this is hours of the of hours of the kth day. Now I'm observing, remember I'm observing the error signal. So I'm going to update my a hat tk based on the error signal as follows. Let me write it as, no, A is already used. I need a vector. Have we used B yet? I don't think we have used B. You don't need to write down all this formula. I think it's not that important but I still want to write down the formula so that I can talk about it. Or, and PT0 is a positive definite matrix. Okay, so what are we doing here? Again, don't write the formula. I think the formula is fine. You can uh, write it up later. I think the important thing to note here 
is to understand what exactly is going on. So at time, on the day k, at time t, I'm going to take the reference signal minus some estimate of this matrix AT, which I did not know about. I don't have any idea about this AT. In fact, this AT might be changing from one day to another. So I look at the estimate of my AT, which is A hat. So A hat is the estimate. Uh, multiplied by this function f, evaluated at x t k, and that's my control action at time, at time t on the kth day. Remember, t is hours and k is the day. Now, I need to update this estimate based on what I saw yesterday. Okay? So I look at the a hat t that was there yesterday. I have this positive definite matrix. Remember, this is a vector. So I have this positive definite matrix multiplied by this vector, multiplied by this error. But, but just important thing to note here is that you are looking at yesterday's error, but of the next hour. So today, I want to figure out what this a hat from 3 to 4 p.m. is. I need to know what the error from 4 to 5 p.m. was yesterday. Okay, so that's what I'm looking at here. And then there is a bunch of ways to update this particular positive definite matrix based on what you used in the past. So that's what is uh, given here. And in order to make this equation compact, I basically define this vector B, which is given by this particular expression. But you can notice that all of this is something that you can compute uh, on the fly, like every day you get the new data and you use that data to update your estimate and then you c come up with a policy to solve that particular, to, to implement the policy on that particular day. Okay. So all in all, what these two uh, tools allows you, what adaptive control allows you to do is if you don't know your system perfectly, which could happen because of attacks on the system, if you don't know your system perfectly, there is still some way to, like as long as you know where the uncertainty is, where, what parameters are unknown, and as long as you have the rest of the model of the system, so besides the parameters that are unknown, if you know what the rest of the system's model is, you can actually come up with some way of updating the policy, control policy, in order to control the system in a way that error goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So even here, under this condition, et goes to zero as t goes to infinity. And again, the proof of some of these results takes a lot of effort. And given the system structure, you will have like very different policies. So I'm just showing you uh, examples of system and what policy works for them, what policy updates this uh, function works for them. But if your system had a different format, then this entire set of equations are gonna look very different. So these equations are not something that's going to work for all systems, but it is definitely going to work for systems that are of this form and that are that have real value, like real valued system. So in the future, if you are more interested on these topics, wherein you want to understand for different systems how to come up with these kind of update rules, you need to take a course in adaptive control. Okay, uh, I think we had a course in nonlinear and adaptive control in this department. I'm not quite sure whether it's running this particular year or not. Uh, but we do have a control on adaptive control in the department, so you can take it if you want to know more about these things. So we are not going to talk about adaptive control, but I really want to show you what the power of adaptive control is, what the power of adaptive iterative learning control is, where you can apply some of these ideas and uh, get the uh, tracking error to go to zero in uh, autonomous systems. Uh, an example of this is, for instance, in the, in the rockets, as the rocket is, uh, the, the fuel of the rocket is getting burned, the rocket sheds, you know, like the rockets that goes into space, 90% of the, of the weight of the rocket is actually the fuel. 
Okay, the rocket itself is only 10% of the actual payload is only 10% of the mass. The rest of it is fuel and the engine and all that stuff. And so as the rocket is going up, the mass is changing. When the mass of the rocket is changing, you know, the entire the equation of motion of that particular rocket changes. And so not that they are using adaptive control because in that case they know exactly how the mass is going to change as the rocket goes up and down. Uh, but uh, but those are the areas where the parameter changes so frequently that you really need to use something which takes into account the changing parameter to come up with a policy that's going to work for that particular system. So that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we'll start uh, statistics and probability. So we'll be talking about probability and statistics for the next seven or eight lectures, and then we'll get to attack detection. Thank you.